My name is Mike Kersey, and I'm an associate principal scientist at AstraZeneca, located in Gothenburg, Sweden. And I'd like to thank you for your for watching this webinar, and thank you for your interest in drug sims, uh, which we use to open the cellular black box. The idea behind the black box is that when we evaluate a drug, we obviously keep track of the dose. We want to monitor the plasma concentration. We measure the exposure in the tissue. But when it comes to the cell, where the actual target is, we lose track of it. We say it's in a black box. So we thought it would be worth our effort to try and open the black box and see if we could add that next level of exposure to provide a better view of how drugs reach their targets. So in this webinar, I'm going to talk a little bit about why today intracellular concentrations are particularly important. But I mostly will be talking about our thinking around the problem and how we reached our solution. Uh, but first, I want to talk about the unique collaboration that led to drug sims. As I mentioned, we're located in Gothenburg, Sweden, along with two great universities, Gothenburg University and the Chalmers University of Technology. And around 2015, uh, Andrew Ewing at GU secured funding for the first nanosims in the Nordic countries from the Wallenberg Foundation. So with support from the local universities, Andy formed the chemical imaging infrastructure. And recognizing the collaborative, uh, collaborative opportunities, they took the decision to install the nanosims in the AstraZeneca BioVenture Hub. So the BioVenture Hub is a really cool framework that allows emerging life science companies and academic groups to operate within AstraZeneca with a kind of open innovation ethic, which is very exciting. And there were a lot of great ideas coming from both sides. But the, um, the collaboration kind of coalesced around this problem presented by new drug modalities. <clears throat> so AstraZeneca has been working more and more with new drug modalities, and they don't behave like the small drug molecules that, we, that we're so used to. In general, we have, we have spent most, me, not Astra, has spent most of their time uh, looking at oligonucleotides or ASOs. So if I say ASO or oligo, uh, that's what I'm talking about. So <clears throat> these are nucleic acid-based therapeutics where the aim is to modulate gene expression through an interaction with mRNA. So this interaction happens in the cytosol, and the problem arises because uh, these molecules have a hard time passing through the membrane. So they need to enter the cell through endocytosis. And what this figure does a really good job of showing is that while there are a lot of ways to get into the endosomal pathway, there's not a lot of ways out. And the inset shows that there's good evidence that endosomal escape happens in late endosomes. You can see it's marked LE. But mechanistically, there's not much to say. And this mechanism is so important because the targets we want to reach are not in the endosomal space. And it's my position that the concentration gradient between the late endosome and the cytosol is a key driving factor for endosomal escape. But we have to measure it. So. When I look at this cartoon, it reminds me that we have the capability to measure these structures in real life. So this is a TEM, uh, transmission electron microscopy image of a HEC 293 cells, cell. It's really detailed. And you can make out a lot of the structures that you can see in the cartoon, including the endosomes that are causing all the trouble by keeping the drug away from the target. And we can use nanosims to locate the drug in the endosome. But to me, this still doesn't answer the black, pro blech, black box problem. Yes, the measurement is related to the upstream measurements we make, and it's related to the concentration gradient that I'm so interested in, but it's not comparable since it's presented as a relative intensity. I thought about it this way. How would someone use this data in a simulation? Or, what value from this image would I want to store in a database so that someone could search it and find it useful in the future? And it wasn't immediately obvious to me how this would work without referencing something uh, essential to the system like concentration. So the big idea, drug sims. So this uh, summarizes the motivation behind the project. Uh, drugs need to move through the cells and um, sometimes they get trapped and they can't reach their target. And if they do get trapped, it's hard to tell, right? Because the measurements we use can't access this space. 
So we thought we could use, we could access that space using the nanosims. But early on, we realized that this academic industrial collaboration was going to have to shift towards the academic side if we were going to make any progress, uh, that we needed to go back to basics. And by back to basics, I mean very basic, like what is the sample and what is it made of? So really quickly, uh, this is how we make a sample for the nanosims. Uh, first, we treat ourselves with a labeled drug. And I have to say uh, that here, that uh, nanosims has a very high spatial resolution, and that's why we can measure the endosomes, but it comes at a cost. The ion beam that we use to make the image erases all the molecular information. It basically grinds everything up. So if you want to track a molecule, you need to have some kind of marker, usually like an isotopic label, but an atom that you wouldn't expect in your sample could work too. So uh, we have our labeled drug in the cell. Uh, we fix them. Then we replace the water with epoxy. We section the sample and use electron microscopy to find the cells that we want to analyze. And using the SIMS, we measure the label and reference it to a ubiquitous ion in the sample. Uh, in the example coming up, we use carbon-13. So the ratio we measure will be carbon-13 over carbon-12. And uh, so to get a handle on this, we decided to deconstruct the sample and think about it in terms of its parts. So as I said, we replace the water with the epoxy, and that's the first part. The second part is the biological stuff that's left over, uh, and that's what we call the biomass. Now, the epoxy and the biomass should not be enriched in carbon-13 because all the extra carbon-13 should be in the third part, which is the labeled drug. So with that in mind, our thinking was, when all those components are together, the epoxy and the biomass will dilute the drug signal, depending on how much carbon they bring to the system. So the idea was, that if we could figure out what, what the concentration of carbon was in the epoxy and the biomass, we could use that number to scale our measurement to concentration. So that was the theory, but we had to test it. So in addition to providing uh, the nanosims, the Ewing group also provided the perfect test case. Uh, this is a cartoon of a secretory vesicle from a rat Theochroma cytoma cell. It's uh, perfect for the reasons I list on the size. On the side, <laughs> uh, first the size, uh, 200 nanometers, approximates the size of the endosome we're after. The vesicles contain dopamine, which has a primary amine, which means it's fixable, and we don't have to worry too much about sample prep. It also has this ves vesicular amine, monoamine transporter. And this does two things that are really important. First, it keeps the dopamine concentration high and constant. And second, it allows us to exchange dopamine for the carbon-13 labeled dopamine, which is important because we want to measure it with nanosims. And maybe the most important thing about this system is that you can measure the concentration with an orthogonal method. So we got the test and we got the answer key. But how does Andy's group get us that concentration. So they take a carbon fiber microelectrode and they insert it into the cell. The vesicles will crash into the electrode and rupture, releasing the dopamine, which is electroactive. So if you apply the potential, you can strip some electrons off the molecule, two electrons per dopamine. They monitor the current and the area under that peak is the charge, which is equivalent to the number of molecules. So they can reference that number of molecules back to the volume of the vesicle and we get our concentration. So let's find out how we did. Um, but first, <laughs> the equation at the top represents our first principles approach. Uh, the concentration equals the SIMS measurement, which is that delta term. Then we divide by the number of labels because we're interested in the concentration of the dopamine, not the concentration of the carbon-13. And then we convert to concentration with the concentration of carbon we calculated from the bulk uh, epoxy and biomass. Uh, the image shows the nitrogen distribution of the cell, which gives us an idea of the structure. And we overlay the dopamine concentration image. And so you can see the very 
very small, very concentrated uh, vesicles. And when we compare our measurements to the electric chemistry, we find that it agrees very well. Uh, they got a little bit above 60 millimolar and we got a little bit below. And so this was so encouraging and we call it our Rosetta Stone experiment. I mean, it showed us that we could predict SIM signal from that first principles approach. And I have to say that um, we go back to the principles in this, in this paper every time we design a new experiment. But it also showed us that we can predict the limit of detection for carbon-13, which for these purposes is around one millimolar. And based on everything we knew about ASOs and some back of the envelope calculations, we figured it wasn't gonna be enough. But we also learned that the epoxy was quite well matched to the biomass, so uh, in terms of carbon. Um, so it gave us the idea that it might be possible to generate calibration standards using other labels. Uh, so here's a recap. Um, <clears throat> uh, the concentration in the embedded cell agrees with the uh, in vitro measurement. The sensitivity for carbon-13 labeling is not going to be ideal for oligos. And the embedding epoxy is well matched to the biological material, opening the possibility to generate epoxy standards for quantification. So the epoxy standard is the physical part of the drug sims workflow. So you take your label of choice, you make your standard, you analyze it with the same parameters that you would for your sample, uh, you generate your calibration curve and use it to convert your image into concentration. But the drug sims concept is more about the validation part. And for different labels, it was hard to find another perfect test case. Uh, but we did get a tip from Haibu Zhang and Melissa Passarelli in 2015. They showed that the arrhythmia drug amiodarone is highly accumulated in the lysosomes of macrophages. And they could image the amiodarone with nanosims because it naturally contains an iodine. Uh, we didn't know for sure, but we had a hunch that the concentration in those lysosomes would be above our one millimolar limit of detection for carbon-13. So the idea was to make a carbon-13 labeled amiodarone and validate iodine as a quantitative label using the carbon-13 method. So we made the calibration curve with the dual labeled molecule uh, using the known concentration. Then we plotted it versus the concentration determined with our validated carbon-13 method. And the slopes were almost identical. Um, then we did a kind of on-cell calibration uh, where we selected some ROIs and plotted the concentration determined by the iodine and the concentration determined by the carbon-13 and found a very good correlation. Uh, but the images show that the iodine labeling is far more sensitive. Uh, but I was more impressed by the carbon-13 image that shows that we really did a good job predicting the, the uh, limit of detection. So I was really happy about that. Uh, so uh, back to where we started, ASOs and endosomes, you remember. Uh, so we need to find a labeling strategy for ASOs. So here's a cartoon of our ASO, uh, where the bases are connected by these phosphorothioate linkers. I'm not going to say that again, so PS. And luckily, we can halogenate ASOs with either bromothymidine or iodocytidine. And we can also exchange the sulfur on the PS linker for a sulfur 34, which is more versatile since we don't have to consider the sequence. Again. And we wanted to use both strategies to measure the intracellular concentration. So we used the drug, drug SIMS workflow, generated calibration curves. Uh, the sulfur is on the left and the iodine is on the right and the corresponding images are below. Again, we use the nitrogen distribution to give us an idea of the cell structure. And when we look at the ASO image, we see those steep concentration gradients that I think are, are a key driver to endosomal escape. And uh, when we look at the individual values, uh, we see that the results for sulfur and iodine labeling are very similar. And we take this as a cross-validation for the sulfur labeling. 
we also have a concentration, which is a hard number that tells us about the concentration gradient between the endosome and the cytosol. And importantly, because we have a concentration, we can compare these values to the concentrations that we measure upstream of endocytosis. So to illustrate why this matters, we carried out an in vitro experiment where we compared the incubation concentration to the intracellular concentration we measure using drug sims. Here we used the sulfur 34 ASO and did a series of concentrations starting at 100 nanomolar and increasing tenfold each time. And the ASO image shows that there is an increase in intracellular concentration that corresponds to the incubation condition. Uh, but when we look at the individual measurements, we see that these concentrations are decoupled. We do not see that tenfold increase. And this is what we mean by the black box. So when we evaluate these compounds in vitro, we rely on the incubation concentration to say something about potency. But we know that the concentration that the cell is exposed to is the concentration in that endosomal pathway. And this is why we think this is a powerful measurement uh, it's a better reflection of the cell's exposure to the ASO. Uh, so to summarize, 34S and iodine labeling strategies can be used to quantify the intracellular concentrations of ASOs. We measure intracellular ASO concentrations in the range of hundreds of micromolar. And I think it's so important to consider this concentration when we are thinking about the mechanism of endosomal escape. And finally, uh, the, 10, the 10x increase in incubation concentration is not reflected in the intracellular concentration. And this is the, the main take home message. So we can measure the intracellular concentration and we think this is a better way to evaluate these compounds. And finally, I have some acknowledgements. I mentioned most of the key players in the collaboration slide, but I didn't mention SSF who is funding Cecile Beckhardt sorry for the pronunciation, PhD. And she's been a big part of what we're doing and I'm very thankful for all her help in this. And I didn't mention Kamika, so I'd like to thank Aurelian and Marion uh, for seeing the value in what we're doing and for helping us get the word out. Um, the NanoSims is not what you would call a high throughput uh, instrument and I think there is way too many questions for one lab to handle. Uh, so after this, I expect to see a lot more intracellular drug concentrations coming out of NanoSims labs. And I will stop there and uh, thank you for your attention.